Hello cousins near and far, and welcome to my channel Ancestral Spotlight. If you would be so kind as to subscribe to my channel, I would be very grateful for the support. Thomas Forster was born in 1683 at his family's ancient home, Adderstone Hall, in Northumberland, to parents Thomas Forster of Adderstone Hall and Francis Forster of Bamberg Castle, another branch of the family. The Forster family had, for generations, been governors and high sheriffs in the land, and they held great influence. Thomas attended St. John's College in Cambridge, which was established in 1511 by Lady Margaret Beaufort, mother of King Henry VII of England. In 1706, the Union with Scotland Act passed, followed in 1707 by the Union with England Act. These events are known as the Acts of Union, and their purpose was to unite the parliaments of England and Scotland. The 1708 British general election was the first election held after the Acts of Union was created, and it's here that we see Thomas as a Tory member of Parliament for Northumberland. So, what are Tories and Whigs? Briefly, Whigs were a political party that favored a constitutional monarchy, which kept a monarch's power bound within an established legal layout, whether written or unwritten, and they opposed absolute monarchy, in which a monarch held supreme and unrestricted authority. The Whigs were notably long-standing enemies of the Stuart kings and pretenders, which fell into a hereditary monarchy category with absolute authority. Tories, on the other hand, which emerged in 1678 in England in opposition to the Exclusion Bill that the Whigs supported. The Exclusion Bill aimed to disinherit the heir presumptive, James, Duke of York of the House of Stuart, the future King James II of England and VII of Scotland. Tories were generally advocates of monarchism. It's important to note that the term Jacobite derives from Jacobus, which is Latin for James, and they were a group who wanted to restore James and his descendants to the throne of England and Scotland. Tory rebels were among the ranks of the Jacobite army. Now, the 5th of November was an important date for the Whigs, and an annual sermon was given to commemorate the failed gunpowder plot as well as marking the day William of Orange landed at Torbay in 1688, successfully invading England and dethroning the House of Stuart. In 1709, Henry Sejeverell, an English Anglican clergyman, was chosen to deliver the sermon. His sermon, entitled The Perils of False Brethren, couldn't have been further from what was expected, at least of the Whigs and those who invited him to speak. And the idea that he was hired for the gains of the Tory party came to mind later. Henry Sejeverell's work called out the many troubling details of the state of political affairs at the hands of the Whigs and served in a light sense as a whistleblower of modern equivalents. Although cheered on in the streets, he was soon after impeached by the House of Commons. However, the damage wrought by his sermon was done and the landslide victory the Tories had at the 1710 general election was credited in part to his work. And it's here that we find Thomas Forster voting against the impeachment of Sejeverell. After the Tory victory at the election, Thomas tried to return Tory candidates to Morpeth and Berwick-upon-Tweed, but his attempts were unsuccessful. Thomas supported the Earl of Hertford and James Lothar, both Whigs in working to regulate trade on the border between Scotland and England. In 1713, Thomas voted in favor of a commerce bill with France. That year, he also returned to the British general election but was inactive in Parliament. The precursor of the 1715 rising of Jacobites saw the British throne threatened by supporters of the House of Stuart. Tensions were high, and a rising was imminent. The acts of union were rejected by many, causing resentment of the government among a series of misfortune. Thomas again returned to the British general election, but this time his activities were focused on supporting the Jacobite cause. 
The French King Louis XIV died mere days before the Earl of Mar held up the standard of James VIII at Bremar on September 6th. The Jacobite Rising of 1715 had officially begun, but the minimal French support struck a deep blow at the onset. In response, Parliament passed the Hebus Corpus Suspension Act of 1715, confiscating the lands of rebelling Jacobite landlords and giving them to others who supported the English government. The Jacobites took Inverness. Gordon Castle. Aberdeen. and Dundee. But failed attempts on Fort William and Edinburgh Castle, and the rising seemed to be moving in their favor. However, it was short-lived. Perth proved a turning point for the Jacobites. Mar proved indecisive. With Mar's troops numbering 4,000 to the Duke of Argyle's 1,000, with Argyle having lost 660 men, Mar retreated to Perth, having claimed the day of victory. However, that same day, the Jacobites had two major blows, the surrendering of Inverness and the defeat at Preston, where the English Jacobites had joined the Scottish border Jacobites, and there was great division of focus among the combined ranks. William Gordon, 6th Viscount Kenmore, led the English Jacobites, and Thomas Forster, recognized as General of the Chevalier's forces, stood with the Macintosh of Borland. Among the Northumbrian Jacobites were two peers, James Radcliffe, the 3rd Earl of De Wentwater, and William Widrington, the 4th Baron Widrington, along with Charles Radcliffe, future de jour 5th Earl of De Wentwater. The Forsters were cousins to the Radcliffes, of which Lord de Wentwater was the head of the family. He himself cousin to the old pretender, James Stuart, father of the future Bonnie Prince Charlie. Thomas Forster met with Lord de Wentwater in Northumberland, who was at the head of 300 cavaliers, and proclaimed the pretender at Workwith after invading arrest in London on September 21, 1715, on a charge of being, quote, engaged in a design to support the intended invasion of the kingdom, end quote. They joined another body of rebels north of the border and a detachment from Mars' army. Despite having no military experience, Thomas Forster was elected to lead all Jacobite forces in England. Under his steadfast direction, Lancelot Errington captured the island of Lindisfarne. In the words of Walter Scott, who describes events best in his book, Tales of a Grandfather Being the History of Scotland from the Earliest Times, quote, it seems strange that while possessing a strong party of friends in the country, being a very large proportion of the landed gentry, with a considerable proportion of the populace, the insurgents should nevertheless have suffered themselves to be so completely surprised by the spirit of delusion which possessed the whole party and pervaded all their proceedings, was as remarkable here as on other occasion. While Forster and his companions were thinking of extending the fire of insurrection to Manchester and Liverpool, General Willis, who commanded in Cheshire for King George, had taken measures for extinguishing it entirely. This active general issued orders to several regiments, chiefly of horse and dragoons, quartered in the neighboring counties, appointing them rendezvous in Warrington Bridge on the 10th of November on which day he proposed to place himself at their head, 
and dispute with the rebels their approach to Manchester. At the same time, Willis entered into communications with General Carpenter, whose unwearied exertions had dogged the insurgents from Northumberland and was now advancing upon them. These tidings came like a thunderbolt to Forster's army. Forster had but a choice of difficulties, namely, either to march out and dispute with Major General Willis the passage of the River Ripple, by which Preston is covered, or abide within an open town and defend it by such assistance from fortifications, barricades, or batteries as could be erected within a few hours. The first of these courses had its advantages. The bridge across the Ribble was long, narrow, and might have been easily defended, especially as there was a party of 100 chosen Highlanders stationed there. Beyond the bridge there extended a long and deep lane, bordered with hedges, well situated for defense, especially against cavalry. All this was in favor of the defense of the bridge, but, on the other hand, if Forster had drawn his squadrons of gentlemen out of Preston, he must have exposed them to the rough shock of ordinary troopers, which they were neither mounted nor armed so as to sustain. It was probably this which determined the Jacobite leader to maintain his defense of the town of Preston itself rather than in front of it. The insurgents took judicious measures for this purpose and pursued them with zeal and spirit. Four barricades were hastily erected, the Earl of de Wentwater stripping to the waistcoat, encouraging his men to labor as well as his own example, as his liberality, and the works were speedily completed. Forster and his companions were heavily defeated at the Battle of Preston. Despite winning the first day of the battle, the government received reinforcements and the Jacobites eventually surrendered, but not without great effort to come to terms. Thomas Forster was imprisoned at Newgate. It wasn't long before he escaped, quote, by means of false keys, and having all things prepared, got safely to France, end quote. He was attainted and expelled from Parliament on February 2, 1716. To his great misfortune, Thomas was not included in the Acts of Indemnity, which would have protected his assets despite his insurgent activities. And so, his brother John succeeded him to their ancestral home of Adderstone in 1725. Nearly all the fortunes these Forsters possessed had been sunk into the Jacobite cause. His nephew Thomas remarked in correspondence that he held out, quote, little helps of getting anything from the succession, end quote. Thomas reached Paris and after the old pretender moved to Avignon, he summoned Thomas there sometime in October of 1727, when Thomas was joined again with the English Jacobites at the Stuart Court. He was made steward of the household and served out the remainder of his days in honor. Thomas Forster of Adderstone, Northumbrian Jacobite, died unmarried in Boulogne on October 27, 1738 at the age of 55. His body, after being initially buried at Boulogne, was returned to England and reburied at Bamberg on December 7, 1738, alongside his kin. <laughs>